Hey, good morning, you guys. Welcome back to the channel. Today, we're going to do um, a continuation of uh, some facial exercises for the morning warm up. I'm also going to get into a little bit of the elements um, of design, elements of art, principles of design and art. Um, one of the things that I've always uh, been interested in are the, um, the ways that artists communicate uh, what they do. As uh, a teacher and a scholar, I like to um, put things in terms that not only um, we as artists understand, but also somebody that really doesn't understand the um, you know the basic principles of art and design. You know, as artists, sometimes we expect uh, people that don't live in this artistic world to really understand the concepts, and I think a lot of times that it's frustrating not only on the side of the artist but also on the side of the layman. Uh, somebody that doesn't really understand or had that knowledge. One of the words that I use sometimes that probably isn't the best use of the word, it is the correct use of the word, but I think it has a negative connotation, is ignorance. Um, you know, whenever I uh, illustrate um, something to students, a lot of times I say ignorance is something that you have uh, power over. Um, you know, you can educate yourself uh, much better than somebody else can because it puts it on your terminology. If you have that life and that fervor inside of you to really learn, then uh, ignorance is just, um, it's just a small obstacle um, for you to uh, gain uh, success in your life. I, I have a really um, robust uh, knowledge, you know, people call it useless knowledge, but what I call it is a great treasure trove of uh, items inside of my brain that I've collected over the years. I, I have uh, a really great knowledge of how to fix automobiles and the mechanics uh, there within and, and and of course my my parents and somebody led me to the path but I had to actually walk down that path and throughout the years I've had the opportunity to fix uh, my automobile um, and save me thousands of dollars and and that to me is is one of the great benefits of uh, of our society and learning and and with the knowledge at your fingertips on your phone, I mean, ignorance should never be a problem for anybody. Um, today, we're going to draw some faces. And as I draw the faces, I'm going to describe one of the elements of art. Ele art elements and principles, they're, they're broken down into to two different categories. Elements are typically the, um, the items that you use to create the, uh, the artistic piece, such as... Uh, um, you know, lines. We're going to talk about lines today, whereas principles are kind of like the rules. So, you know, everything's got to have rules these days, right? But, um, you know, these rules obviously are uh, flexible and bendable and merging. And But uh, as an artist, you need to be able to recognize those particular terminologies. This is the stuff that you learn in school and take tests on. We're not going to have any tests today, but um, today we're going to learn a little bit about line and understand exactly what line is. So, uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy the um, the process of creating the faces and learn a little bit and uh, get rid of some of that that uh, ignorance that um, uh, that is inside. You know, ignorance to me is something obviously that is solvable. It is not an insult if you're ignorant of something you just don't know. That is, it's kind of a fancy word um, of something that you don't know. And obviously, you can you can uh, you can solve that problem um, by listening. <laughs> Most of the time, people are doing too much of this and not enough of this. That's one of the things that I teach. You need to do a lot more of this and a lot more seeing, and and a lot less talking. So anyway, I'm going to stop talking. Um, and and uh, well, I am going to talk, but you know what I mean. So enjoy, and uh, we'll see. You, um, we'll see you soon. Okay. So um, line. What is line? Um, line is defined um, by uh, a lot of the art dictionaries out there as being um, an element of art that is defined by a point moving in space. So you have a point, basically, and it moves through space, okay? And basically, whenever it moves through space, it, you know, if you have a point and it lands on this paper and it moves through space, then you have this wonderful line. Lines, um, you know, they may be two-dimensional, 2D, 
which is what you see here, or we move into the 3D. 3D happens is whenever we have the intersection of the lines, okay? And then you have placement of said line to create three-dimensional looking objects. This is kind of a simple square tri or a triangle in three-dimensional space. Um, you know, we have descriptive lines. Descriptive lines could be um, just about any type of line because if you start describing a form uh, using lines, then you're going to have different types of lines. You have, you know, um, really uh, fl flowing and descriptive lines. You have different line thicknesses. Um, abstract lines uh, are another uh, type of line. Um, implied, you could have an implied line such as in a cloud. Um, let me get up here, over here. Such as in a cloud, so if I were to have a cloud coming around. I have lots of descriptive lines. But also you have sort of an inner line of action. That line that kind of goes from here to here. That's an implied motion. Okay, that implied motion. Um, you know, descriptive I've talked about. Descriptive being something that I like to describe a form. So whenever I think three-dimensionally, I use the lines to describe the form. So in this cloud, I know it's got multi-dimensional surfaces. So I start putting in these small little descriptive lines that really tell that story of exactly what this cloud kind of looks like a piece of poop. Sorry about that, so we'll put some other stuff up here. <laughs> I don't know why that struck me as a piece of poop. Anyway, this is much better. It's a pile of poop now. So, um, you know, we have dashed lines. Obviously, we know what those are. We have um, uh, dotted lines, you know, whenever we put dots. Now, this is, of course, like an implied line because although we see the dots, they're put into a formation that shows this, this progression of motion, this progression of... Uh, you know, of uh, shape. So, you know, we can make it get a little bit more interesting as the tighter they get, it makes it look like it's going farther away. These are all tricks that, not tricks, these are all elements and things that artists use to create pictures. You know, we have motion lines. Motion lines um, are designed to um, kind of help a form uh, be, you know, give it some life. So, you know, if I were to draw a hand and I were to have some lines uh, on the outside and maybe go through, it really gives it a sense of motion and life. You know, instead of uh, just, just basically drawing a really boring line. Lines to me are wonderful because obviously I use them all the time whenever I draw. Um, they help me define my forms uh, in a three-dimensional world. Um, one of the most important aspects of line, obviously, as an artist and illustrator, is what I call line thickness. Now, a lot of times whenever I watch young people draw, they'll draw using their wrist, and they'll have this very singular thought that... I'm drawing, therefore, I need to settle down. I need to uh, basically focus on the line because the line is what is going to be perfect. There's such a there's such a, a mentality towards perfection whenever young people draw, and even older people draw, because they think they're gonna make a mistake, and if they make a mistake, therefore, it's going to look bad. The challenge with that is, is you need to get over that. The, the reason and, 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 the, and, the, and the why uh, artists and, and successful illustrators and concept artists have such a look to their um, artwork is because they've, they've ripped off those chains and they've taken the lines to, a, to the next level. They've combined that implied, that descriptive, that dash, that dotted, all the motion, and they've created something called line weight. So if I were to do, let me get, I'm going to do a face right now. So basically, we're going to kind of combine those things really quick, and we're going to do um, we're going to do a face utilizing these particular uh, items pertaining to line. So what I'm doing right now is I'm putting in something called construction lines. 
I am thinking of a face. I'm thinking of a form. Okay, because again, we're thinking three-dimensionally all the time. This is not a solid, hard surface. This is a world that your drawing lives in. So you need to think three-dimensionally. Stop thinking about the flat surface. So the lines, the lines are there. It's sort of like, a, I, I, I literally, this is the way I think when I draw. I think of my line as kind of like a tool. It's a tool that is shaping that three-dimensional surface. So, I'm using my lines right now to just outline my form. You know, get that silhouette, that readable silhouette. You know, a lot of times you'll hear um, artists, you know, and this is very true, especially whenever I was in college, one of the observations was, uh, does it have a strong silhouette? Can it be recognized as the object if you were to remove all the interior descriptives and just have it as an outline? It needs to have a clear silhouette. You know, um, in, in animation, a lot of times, whenever you're doing figures, you, the, uh, the uh, director or the uh, creative director or whoever is in charge of the head animator will look at that particular animation and he'll see that your silhouette isn't strong. It doesn't have a descriptive silhouette. This is very true. Um, in, in character faces and just about everything that you do. Logos is another example. But for the sake of what we're doing right now, the lines are here to basically describe your object and form in three-dimensional space. So what I'm doing right now is I'm basically blocking in and using my lines to describe my form, the descriptive lines. Now, I haven't really established exactly what kind of a face this is, However, I know it's going to be long. It's kind of going to be goofy. I know the person's going to have kind of like a huh expression. And what I'm doing is lightly blocking in exactly where I want stuff to be. And he's going to probably be wearing a shirt. And he's going to have a little bit of a beard that comes down. Maybe the shirt curves around. A simple little background. Um, and again, if you look at this, I didn't sit there and I didn't... I didn't focus on any particular one area. I'm blocking in the entire form and drawing in a rough sense to understand where it's going to live in three-dimensional space. Now I start getting something called um, line thicknesses and I'm going to use the stroke to accentuate and give the uh, drawing a little bit more form. Stroke, obviously you guys know what stroke is. It's a fluid motion in such a way, in a direction, to uh, to create a line that describes the form. So sometimes I see people use their stroke, and it's very short and jagged. Some drawing or some artists have very draw, you know, jagged lines, and to me, that is one way to do it. <laughs> there are so many ways, you know, your stroke can be so many different you know, aspects and it, and it just depends on what your style is. And this is something that you'll, um, you'll really develop over time. Now, me personally, I'm kind of the, men, of the mentality because I, I have sort of a, um, a motion mentality and animation uh, background mentality. I, my stroke is very long and it's fluid and it's very lively. Can you get that same stroke if you were to do something like this? Absolutely. I've seen incredible drawings, you know, using that that really jagged, you know, method. And that's fine. It just depends. So I worked on my stroke for a while. That sounds kind of weird. However, I did. And it just depends, obviously, on what style I'm doing. But the majority of the time... I have this particular style. So, stroke. I start putting in very loosely what my particular character is going to look like. And if you look, my wrist is completely locked. It's locked right now. I'm using my whole arm to create that stroke. This is my style. This is how I draw on a regular basis. Yours might be completely different. You might, you might, uh, you know, I really don't know. It just depends on, on what you developed over time and or, or what you're most comfortable with. Because at the end of the day, you need to find that happy medium in your drawing style that caters to how your brain works. Now, 
is this going to change over time? Heck yeah. The more you draw, the, um, the more you will find your pathway. Okay, so now if you look, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm varying like my lines, okay? Very expressive, very descriptive lines. However, there's a variation. This line right here is not gonna be um, the same as this line because there is a, um, there's a form that wraps around here and when you have two surfaces come together, depending on gravity, gravity is going to be pulling down on this eyelid. So you're gonna have a thickness uh, right here that is not going to be the same as the thickness on the eyebrow, okay? And then I'll shade it in. Then I'll have this here. And whenever you have typically two surfaces that come together, you want the surface in the foreground to have a darker line because that's what's, what's, what's it gonna do? It's gonna pull the um, object you want out further, such as the nose, so the line on the nose is gonna be much, much uh, darker. And then whatever comes around here, this surface right here is gonna be thinner and it comes on the bottom and it's gonna be darker on the bottom. This is something that you guys as artists and developing illustrators and graphic designers are going to learn as you start working in this, um, in this world of drawing. It's gonna have a crazy look to him, okay? Okay, so here we are. Got this uh, ear that comes out. It's gonna be a little bit thinner on the top. And I've just roughed it in. I've roughed that shape in. Now I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna draw in some of the details. Not going out of control. And again, this particular line is gonna be thicker than this line coming here. And then this line coming here is gonna get thicker because it's above the shirt. This ear is thicker because it breaks that plane right here. Okay, so then we come down here. We're gonna go further down. Come here. There we go. This mouth's gonna come out. And two, one of the things that I think too is, um, and I noticed this uh, recently because I was watching one of the students draw, he was very confused on the process of defining and getting those forms right because he would draw part of a nose and then this part of the nose would be completely whacked and the proportions would be wrong and it would look completely te you know, terrible in his eyes. What I saw was a great opportunity for him to learn something. Whenever I do a shape a lot of times, if you watch whenever I draw, I'll start out, obviously, you know, I could sit here and do this, you know, but what, what that does is it stops me, it separates me and it puts me on a flat plane and it stops me from sculpting my drawing. I basically will start out thinking three-dimensionally. So thinking three-dimensionally, I have to look at this, okay, I have my circle, and then I'm already thinking about the jawline. I'm already thinking about the neck. So basically, I'm kind of thinking here, and if I come around here and I draw this motion line, I can get down to what I'm thinking about. So here, and I just barely draw part of the jawline on this side, and I'll come up here, and if you notice, I had that, that line come up here, even though I might not use this line, it's there as a mental reference and visual reference. So I'll come back here, and I'll redefine exactly what I want to do. And I'm constantly correcting, and I've got the shirt that comes out. And look, see how I did that small little descriptive line right here? It gives me something on the page to go from. So even though it might not be the actual line that I'm going to use, maybe I want to make it a little bit... I can adjust it, okay? And you see how I have that, again, that line of action that comes here. It defines uh, the form in, in a very, very subtle way, very loose. You know, and I come back to this particular drawing and I'll draw this, you know, I'll draw this mouth that comes here and I'll come around and I know the teeth are gonna come down here and I've got these teeth that come around like this. And 
even though these aren't, it, it doesn't look good right now, what's gonna happen is it gives me an opportunity to correct and get those new, or get those harder descriptive lines in there that really describe what the mouth is doing. Get a little bit of shadow in here, okay? He's got a bit of a little lip that comes around, okay? And then, so I, I, I'm thinking, uh, now I'm down here, I'm thinking about what I'm doing up here because again, I'm thinking about the whole picture. You know, giving these lines in here help the character and I want his beard to come out and I want his beard to come out around here, okay? And it's still, it's still very rough, but look, I've already got a nice sense of the lines of exactly how I'm gonna utilize these lines and what I'm going to do. And I want his hair to kind of be like, kind of like, kind of like Elvis, but not, not really. He's kind of kind of like a curl here, okay? And he's got, it comes around here. He's got these sideburns that come around. And since his head on this side is shaped a certain way, I wanna continue that line that comes up and it comes out and it comes around. And whenever you have um, not only intersecting lines, but also uh, differentiating lines of, um, of, of motion, it really creates a lot of character. So this goes this way. My first inclination in my brain is to do this. Okay, because it, it helps round out that form. So what I'll do, because you have to, it goes this way here, and then it goes this way here. And then again, you have this line that comes down, and then you have this form that comes the other way. So you have this constant push and pull, these lines, this, this kind of yin and yang shape that always follows kind of the, the, the way nature, you know, works. And again, you know, I always keep saying, these are the things that you learn as you draw a lot. It becomes a feeling. I know that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? Itchy. I say it is a feeling. You need to feel your way. But it actually is. It's a weird thing that, you know, artists develop. Let me have this kind of expression that comes down. And his beard comes up, and he's got a little bit of a, comes around. It, it is, guys. It's, it's a feeling that you get whenever you look at a piece of artwork, and you can tell whether or not it has balance. You can tell whether or not it has feeling. You can read the emotion in it. And what I tell the kids uh, at school is the fact that there are things that you don't even realize that are happening that define and they shape the way that you you make decisions. You know, I'm like, you know, can anybody tell me why they like certain products, certain, co you know, like Coke? I said, because you've been told to like Coke. You know, you might think you like the taste, but at the end of the day, I mean, Coke doesn't really taste that great. It's sweet, I mean, the sugar tastes good. But a lot of times, we don't even know why we like stuff. It's weird, it's a weird anomaly that I think that, you know, we should investigate a little bit more. You know, I started really questioning why I like certain things and it really helped develop my teaching style and really helped me out overall. Lines, going back to lines. You know, I've been, you've been seeing me use my stroke, you've seen variation of line, you've seen descriptive lines that help define the form. You've seen me use three-dimensional lines, lines that intersect, overlapping lines. You've seen, um, you know, line weight, line thicknesses. I, I've used different line weights here to show uh, and help define forms. I've used a little bit of shadowing, um, which isn't, you know, isn't really lines per se, but it helps really define uh, the uh, face overall. So. I think that we're gonna stop right there and I'm gonna put you guys on time lapse for a few minutes to kind of watch me um, ink this thing. Now, whenever I ink this thing, you're gonna see, you're gonna see me utilize, I, you, you guys have seen these before, these uh, brush markers. What's great about the brush marker is I can get such an incredible variation of line because 
I can come here and I can draw a straight line down and whenever I turn it, you get that nice line thickness here and then it comes here and you see I can get that different variation of line. That variation of line helps define the form, okay? It really just helps define the form. Okay, so I'm going to put you guys on time lapse and you guys get to see this guy um, come to life and um, hopefully you guys are enjoying the videos. I've done actually two videos that I didn't particularly like because I ended up rambling on um, and I ended up deleting them. So I'm trying to get a little bit better of a format um, for these drawing videos. One of the things that recently uh, somebody made a comment on was traditional versus digital. And I'm gonna do a, a, a video pertaining to this conundrum and this question, because in some respect, um, I think digital is fantastic. I love digital um, art. I've, I've pretty much used digital art for almost 17 years. I've worked on a Wacom Cintiq. I've used uh, different programs to facilitate and create my artwork. Um, however, what this has done is it's, it's, it's not a crutch, it is a tool. However, I noticed that a lot of times my mentality was not to do things, um, I don't want to say right the first time. It, it gave me the opportunity to experiment much more. And the speed is such that I can manipulate and change things um, at whim from color to, you know, put layer, uh, layers in there. But what traditional does is it kind of grounds me. It makes me, it, it gives me a calming sense. So for me, I think uh, in my private time sketching, for me, whenever I'm not on the clock doing stuff for people, I like traditional a lot. Um, if I'm doing work, if I'm on a deadline, if I'm working in that sense, I, you know, I do need those tools. I need that control Z, that undo. I need that, that possibility of doing color versions you know, of layer compositing, of uh, manipulation of the size. You know, I need all those things. And that's kind of the, the conundrum. I, I think that digital is great. I think that traditional is fantastic. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that they're just tools for expression. And I love doing both. So um, I don't think really one takes precedence. I, I guess it does whenever you're thinking about work. Obviously, digital is going to be better for work. But for me, personally, I like traditional um, whenever I'm doing my private and my fun stuff. So anyway, thank you guys. We're going to put you on time lapse. Bye.